Welcome to the Continuum Lab and welcome to the future, because as I'm filming this, we have just entered the year 2020. Now, if you had taken aside, say, 12-year-old me in the mid-80s, and you'd asked him when the technology would be available so that you could make a fully functional electronic bass guitar out of cardboard and copper tape and matches, then he would probably have said something like 2020, without actually believing that it would ever really happen. But here we are, it's the future, my non-existent dream from the 80s has come true, and here it is. So this is the MIDI bass guitar that we fabricate in my Continuum Lab workshops, which I'm currently offering to schools and institutions. This might be the most challenging of the four basic instruments that we make in the workshop, but uh, possibly also one of the most interesting to build and play with. I'll let you decide, you can tell me in the comments. Anyway, in this video I'm going to show you the whole process of how I made it, start to finish, silly mistakes included. Let's get started. So this should be interesting. For those of you who have followed along in my previous videos, specifically the Control Freak video series, you might have seen this instrument here. I call it the MIDI Lely, which means that it's a ukulele MIDI controller, kind of. The capacitive sensor strings are made out of the cable itself with no other electrode attached, and the sensitivity is not very good. The box that I used is too small to hold and play comfortably. Let's make something better. Okay, so if the box is too small, then how big is big enough? A bass guitar is quite large, but I'm not going for a realistic size here. I'm just trying to make sure that it's realistically playable. I think 50 centimeters should be about right. Let's get some cardboard and see what we can do. I want the 50 centimeter length to go along the corrugation this way. I'll make the piece 20 centimeters wide, and then I can cut it down to size once I figure out the details. Let's cut that out. There, 50 by 20 centimeters. This is double corrugated cardboard, and as you can see, the two sides of corrugation are not the same size. I'll use these waves here in the larger size to measure out the next step. First, I'll measure two waves of the corrugation and mark the cardboard like this. Next, I count out three more waves and mark the fourth. Why should it be exactly this size? Well, I explained this in an earlier video where I made this recorder MIDI controller. Three waves of this corrugation makes a section wide enough to fit the electronics inside comfortably, like you see here. That will be the depth of our MIDI bass guitar body. Next, we measure out the section which will form the width, which needs to be about twice as long as the other side. Then we make another section like the first one, and then we check that what's left over is as wide as the wider one we made before. I'll probably end up removing this section here. Next, we expand all these marks by using a finger to break one side of the cardboard along the length of the corrugated pattern. That will weaken the cardboard along these nice straight lines, allowing me to make straight clean bends. There. Easy as that. Take care when bending that you only bend along the marks, so that you get nice square corners. One section is a bit too wide, but I'll take care of that in a minute. First, to show you what I'm trying to make, let's take a step back to my previous video where I built this capacitive keyboard. Looking at it from the side, we can see that it's bent in pretty much the same way as what we're doing now. And one side works as a lid, which stays closed thanks to this lip here on the side. That's what we're doing with the new instrument as well. I'll start with the lip or hook. First, I'll remove a couple of sections of it so that I'm left with several separate lips along the length of this edge. Those will be bent in like this, past 90 degrees, same as I just showed you on the keyboard. To hold them in place, I'm using some hot glue, which is quick and easy to use. This is my go-to solution for all these bends, and it works great on cardboard. There. I made three separate lips, but that's not really terribly important. It could be one or two. Next up, I'll glue these other two bends into place. Apply three or four globs of glue like this, bend the section into place, and then hold it in place while the glue sets. Same for the other one. There. This last section is the lid, which needs to move freely, so I won't glue that. It's definitely too wide, so I'll need to remove a section to allow it to fit in behind the lip. I'll measure that by eye and then cut it off. I like to weaken the edge of this piece like this, which will make it easier to open and close. Hmm, okay, almost cut off too much there, but whatever, it'll be fine. Cool, time to get out some electronics. Here's my breakout board for the Teensy LC. This is an awesome combo for making MIDI instruments, as I've already explained in previous videos. 
Also, the width of it is just right to fit inside the cardboard structure that I just made. But if I'm being honest, then it looks like it's possibly a little bit too tall for the lid to close comfortably. Hmm. Okay, I'll get back to that. We'll see how it goes. I'll also need one of these multiplexer modules, which lets me easily connect up to 16 sensors. It plugs into the breakout board right here and fits inside the instrument, no problem. To connect the individual sensors, I'll use these jumper wires, which have one end stripped so that I can easily solder onto them or paint with conductive paint. 16 of them will plug into the multiplexer and four will plug directly into the breakout board like this. Uh, okay, that makes closing the lid even more problematic. Hmm. Whatever. Time to define where everything goes and how to hold and play the instrument. This will be the right hand and this will be the left hand. So this is where I'll plug the strings and this will be the fretboard. Nice. Time to draw in the frets. I'll make them around 3 cm long with around 1 cm between the strings. For some reason I decided to make the distance between frets progressively shorter up the fretboard, which is very realistic for a bass guitar, but definitely and completely overkill for this prototype. Also, it will make everything slightly more complex when I start making the strings. Damn it. Anyway, this looks pretty good. That should be quite playable. As you can see, there's a total of 16 string sections on here, which means 16 sensors, all connected to the multiplexer. Now for the right hand or plucking section. I'll make this a bit longer than the fretboard sections, around 5 cm should do it. That'll allow me to play with two fingers, with a bit of space still left over. String distance will be just over a centimeter, which is a bit small, but should be quite playable. Nice. Next up, strings. The plan is to use these matches here. I'll wrap the electrode layer around them, making for a large surface, and then I'll put a thin dielectric layer on top of that. First I'll have to cut them down to size. I want a separate match for each string section, so I cut them into the lengths that I measured out on the fretboard. If you make one of these instruments, then don't make these sensors different lengths like I did. Just make them all exactly the same size, it makes this step much easier and it will work just fine. The electrode material will be this adhesive copper tape and I'll use this transparent packing tape as the dielectric layer, at least for the fretboard. I'm a bit concerned that it won't be strong enough for the section where the strings will be plucked, so I'll try something different for that. More on that later. Next I make some copper tape pieces which are almost as long as the matches and wide enough to roll around each match, covering it fully. Applying them to the matches is quite easy, just stick them down at one side like this and then roll the match carefully until the tape is fully attached. Make sure you leave a bit of the match uncovered at the end. This is just so that when you put the matches down end to end, the copper tape pieces don't touch each other. I'm feeling pretty good about these string centers. The size of them is similar enough to a bass string that they should be comfortable to play, and the match as a basic structure is more than strong enough for this use. Again, I have to number these because they are different lengths. If you've been more sensible than me and made everything the same length, then you can safely ignore this step. Next, and before I apply the dielectric layer, I need to attach a cable to each string section. I'll get out my trusty soldering iron and some solder. This kind of copper tape is super easy to solder to. If you've never soldered before, this is a great place to learn. First, I apply a bit of solder to one end of the copper tape. The ends of the cables are already tinned, which makes this even easier. Just lay down the end of the cable over the tin on the copper tape. Touch with the tip of the soldering iron for a couple of seconds until the solder melts. Remove the soldering iron and presto! Here's all 16 of them. Now it's time to apply the dielectric layer. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory. Stick the tape down at one end and then roll it onto the match like this. The two most important things here are to make sure that the transparent tape covers the copper tape completely and to not make too many layers of it. Preferably just one layer, at least along the top side of the sensor. The thicker the dielectric layer, the lower the sensitivity. Repeat that operation with all the string sections. There, I'll put those aside for a moment and try to figure out how I'm going to make the right hand section. First of all, these sensors will be longer, about 5 cm each, which is just a bit shorter than the full length of the matches. That's what that looks like. The next couple of steps are the same as with the other sensors. Apply copper tape just like before, then put a bit of solder at one end and then solder the cables on there. Now for the dielectric layer. I've decided to try some heat shrink tube for this. No, that one is a bit too big, I think. Yeah, those are also too big, although they might be interesting for other experiments in the future. This is what I'm looking for. Heat shrink tubing is quite strong and durable, so I'm pretty sure that this will handle being strummed and plugged better than the packing tape. I'll grab a couple of them in a color I like, and then I cut them down to the right size. To make the tube shrink, just apply heat. 
A heat gun would be better for this, but a lighter works just fine, with a bit of care and making sure to apply the heat evenly. Ok, so before I go on with the rest of them, I need to check the sensitivity. I'm not actually completely sure if the heat shrink tube might be too thick for this. So I'll just quickly plug my sensor into the breakout board, upload a bit of code and read the results of the sensor. Hmm. The sensitivity is quite low, but I think it's more than sufficient for this. So, so now I finished the other three sensors as well, and I'm ready to start attaching them to the instrument. I'll need to make a hole for each cable, which I think can go right here and then I pull the individual cables through. As I mentioned, this section will be strummed and plucked and probably manhandled quite a lot, which is why I'm scratching and scoring the surface here like this. This will help the hot glue to form a much better adhesion. And now it's time for the glue. I'm applying really rather a lot of glue to the sensors on this section. There's glue under each sensor along the length, and then an extra blob at each end, and then also a bead of glue along each side of each sensor. Most probably complete overkill and also a bit of a mess. As I always say, if you want it pretty, then make it pretty. But first and foremost, make sure that it works. <laughs> yeah, that looks pretty crazy. But the sensors are stuck on there really well, which was my first priority. Now for the fretboard. Again, I'll perforate here once for each sensor and then lightly scratch the surface where I'll be applying the glue. There's an order to these sensors where the topmost string at the end of the instrument is the first one and the lowest string near the base is the last. I should probably number these on the inside before I pull the cables through, that will make it much easier to plug everything in afterwards. I'll insert four of the cables at a time, starting with the four at the end. The idea is the same as before, but please notice that I'm using less glue here, a lot less. Because of the way a bass guitar is played, these sensors will receive much less abuse than the four sensors at the other end. These will mostly be pressed down from above without the lateral pressure of the plucking action. So no need to make a mess of glue here. I'll also point out that where the plugging section sensors are attached at a 45 degree angle so that they have two exposed diagonal surfaces for maximum contact when plugging, the fretboard sensors here are laid down flat, giving a larger surface area on the top side. There. That looks pretty good, and it feels pretty decent as well, in the sense that I think it will be quite playable. Wow, yeah, okay, now it's starting to look like something. Next up, I need to connect all these cables. The four cables on the right-hand section plug directly into the breakout board, and these other 16 cables will go through the multiplexer. Let me just fix the breakout board in here with a bit of hot glue, which will make everything easier to organize afterwards. I'll start by plugging in these four sensors. I know which one is the first one because I numbered all the other sensors down here on the fretboard before. Find sensor number one there and then trace down to the other end. There. I'll plug these sensors into the pins shown at the bottom of the screen right now. These are the sensors marked with a C for capacitive on the breakout board. To connect the rest of the sensors, I'll need the multiplexer. Plug that in right here and then start plugging in the sensors. The order of these is easy because we numbered the cables before. Next, I want to glue the multiplexer in place. Let me see. Looks like the cables are not quite long enough to fit this in here comfortably. If I move the breakout board further in, that should fix it. Unstick it from here, apply some new glue, and then reinsert the board. And now I should be able to fit the multiplexer in here, somewhere in the middle. I glue it in right here on the side where it's out of the way. Nice. Now I can just compact the cables here a bit, and then close everything back up. The last sensor we need is the calibration button. I'll put it right here on the inside wall, out of the way. Calibration is fundamental for these instrument builds, because the DIY sensors always end up slightly different from one build to the next. The calibration routine allows the instrument to adapt to that, so it works even with this variation in the sensor readings. There, close it up again, and we're done. The only thing left to do now is to plug in the USB cable, and then bring this over to the computer to see if everything actually works. Before this instrument does anything, except look great, I have to put some code on it. The bass guitar sketch is available for download on the Continuum Lab GitHub page. The link is in the description of the video. So I'll download that from there and then upload it to the instrument using Arduino. Now, before I connect the instrument and software, I'll quickly calibrate the sensors by pressing the calibration button and keeping it pressed as I activate all the other sensors. That way the instrument won't have some annoying note sounding already when I open up my software synthesizer. So now I'm ready to open up Yoshimi and then connect the software through jack. And we're done. Let's try it out.
So I'm obviously not a very good bass player, but even so, I'm really happy with how this turned out and how it works. Certainly much better than my first proof of concept, and it looks much better too. This one has more sensors, enough for the whole chromatic scale, and the software now lets me vary the volume on each string when plucking. I added this string here so that I can hang the instrument uh, over my shoulder, same as I would do with the real bass. I managed to not get that on camera, but uh, it's really pretty simple. I just passed the string through the side walls here and here, and then secured it with a knot and a bit of hot glue. I guess if I were to add something else, it would be a bass body shape of some kind around here to make it look and feel a bit more like the real thing. But I want this basic model to be as simple as possible because as I mentioned, this is one of the instruments that we make in my Continuum Lab workshops, which I'm currently offering to schools and institutions. This is the third video in a series of four that I'm currently making about these instruments. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss the next one, uh, as well as all the other cool projects like this that I regularly upload, then you should definitely subscribe right here in the Continuum Lab YouTube channel and also find me over on Instagram also as Continuum Lab. And if you're interested in hosting one of these workshops and making some of these instruments at your school or event, then get in touch with me for more information. And that's it for today. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Take care until next time and I'll see you in the continuum.